Hey, welcome to Grace Church San Diego. My name is Scott, and I am your outreach pastor. Hey, before we dive into the message, I want to encourage you to, wherever you're tuning in from, share this message. This message will bring hope to your friends, your family, your coworkers. So do me a favor and share this right now. And as before we dive in, let's pray. Let me, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we just pause uh, whatever's going on. We uh, remove distraction, and we focus on you right now. And I just pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts, our minds, uh, as we look into um, things that you said, Jesus. I pray that it would penetrate and that it would apply in our daily lives in practical ways, um, but it would also draw us close to you. Uh, we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So uh, a long time ago, as I was entering into ministry, I made a couple big steps in my faith towards my calling into ministry. And the first one was to become a youth leader. And then the second one was to do missions. And uh, my, first, my very first trip in taking a team was to South America. I took a team to Peru. And we put on this big youth camp, and I took a team down there, and we partnered with the youth group. And throughout the couple weeks that I was there, I got really close with a young man. His name is Jesus, and Jesus and I, throughout the couple weeks, he was just right next to me, and I poured into him, and I got really close with him. Well, towards the end of the trip, uh, we were talking, and he shared his dream for him to come to the U.S., and as I sat there and heard, I was young, I was 23, 24, uh, I wanted to help him get to America, and so I told him I would do everything I could to help him once I'm home in the States. And so I flew home and the very next week I had major reconstructive surgery on my hip. And then uh, I went through rehab and nine months of rehab and it was very difficult. And at the end of the day, I, I never did it. I never helped him. I never did anything. I made him a promise. I'd said something in my behavior didn't back it up. And this isn't just a problem for me. It's a problem for all of us. We all do this. And let me be clear, this isn't just about broken promises. It's about saying one thing, saying something, and living totally different. We live in this culture today of not following through, of saying one thing and doing another. You know, we have a, a family business. My wife has this business, and we talk about it all day long all the time where we work with vendors and distributors and companies and landlords where nobody, it seems like nobody follows through with what they say they're going to do. It's prevalent in Southern California, right? My East Coast in-laws make fun of Southern Californians all the time because we're known as flaky. We say, how are you? And we just hope to get a surface level answer. We say, let's get together. And we truly, truly don't even mean it. This is embedded in our culture. We say one thing and we do something else. Now, when it comes to our faith, though, our lives often do not reflect the faith that we claim to have. And you see that in the church. We see it all the time. It's why in my servant leadership program, I've, made, I've emphasized this concept to under-promise and over-deliver because it's the reverse that we do on a daily basis. So why is this so important? Why is this concept of following through of, of who we are on the outside matching who we are on the inside, of our lifestyle matching up with our beliefs in what we say? It's because when we say one thing and our behavior doesn't back it up, we fail others and we fail ourselves. We do not reflect godly character in our relationship. Well, we end today the series on Ghosted. It's, called, it's been called Ghosted where we've invited God to speak into how we form relationships together. And we've done that because it's so obvious that God cares deeply about our relationships. He speaks about, through the scriptures, throughout the library of scriptures, so much about how we treat one another in interpersonal relationships. And so week one, Pastor Nolan shared how two can accomplish more than one and how we're made for relationships, if you remember that. Week two, I talked to you about how to communicate. If you remember, to, in James's words, to uh, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and to be slow to anger. And then last week, Pastor Jesse talked about how lasting relationships are built upon honor. And then we get to today, the last week of this series, where we're not just speaking of love in a general sense, but how to put love in action and how to live it out in our daily lives. 
Today we're going to look at scripture and we're going to look at the book of John. It's found in the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four gospels that are known as the gospels. And why I love this book so much, you should read the entire book. Why I love it is because the first three gospels, the first three books are really an account of what happened with Jesus, of what Jesus did, his ministry, his miracles, his teachings, all those things. John speaks of those things as well, but he emphasizes who Jesus is, which is why it is so important. You see, Jesus, during his ministry, he performed miracles. He taught a lot. He taught crowds and his disciples, and his his teachings were contagious. But some of the most significant moments to me are those he spent with his closest friends, his disciples. And we're going to be looking at one of those Today We're going to be looking at one main scripture in John 13. I'm going to talk about a couple others, one in John 15, as well as in the beginning. But here we are in this moment where the, Jesus and his followers are having supper, having a meal together. His ministry is coming to an end, and he's going to be taken soon to be killed. So this is the setting. The 12 disciples, Jesus, they're sitting around, they're eating a meal together, and at some point, Jesus stands up. He gets up from where he is sitting. He takes off, it says, his outer garments, his robe, and he gets this towel and he ties it around his waist. He grabs a basin, a big bowl. He puts water in it. And then without any words, he goes to his disciples and he kneels. And I want you to picture this. He kneels in front of his disciples and he starts washing their feet. And they, I just picture it, they're just shocked. They're, they're, they don't know what to think, what to do. They're a little stressed out. They're not saying anything until it gets to Peter. Jesus comes in front of Peter getting ready to wash his feet. And Peter kind of has a freak out moment. And he's like, what are you doing? You can't wash my feet. And Jesus responds and says, you don't, know, you don't understand now, but you will. This is something I must do. And then it gets to verse 12 in chapter 13. Read along with me. It says this. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he put his robe back on and resumed his place. He sat back down. He said this to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Jesus, in this significant moment, some of the final moments of his life here on earth, he puts love into action. He doesn't just teach, but he behaves accordingly. He is serving his followers in a way that models, that reveals his love and the way we should love one another. It's all about relationships. So the first point, the first thing I want us to see as we look at the scripture in this moment, in the context of our relationships, is we need to see Jesus for who he is. And you say, what does that have to do with our relationships? Well, listen, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am, in verse 13. I am the Lord and teacher. So we need to see Jesus for who he is. Because if we see him as our Lord and our teacher, We are then his disciples, his followers, his students. See, in that Jewish culture, the normal setup was a teacher, a rabbi, and a disciple, a student, a follower. This speaks both of his position in the world and in life and our position with him in our life. And I feel like so many of us make this claim. We're Christians. He is my teacher. He is my Lord. But yet our lives don't reflect him at all. That is so convicting for so many of us, and it's true, because I see it. I see Christians, instead of loving disagreement, we fight over silly things. We fight over masks and all these things. Instead of investing in our church community, we come and consume instead of serving. Instead of trusting the Lord with our entire lives, we're gripped with worry and stress and anxiety, leaving us to do nothing but complain. Instead of seeking meaningful conversations with people in our lives, with this agenda, outward agenda of how you could serve and love people, we talk about surface level topics that don't even matter. You see, in this part of scripture, Jesus assures them of who he is. 
He is their Lord. He is their teacher. He is our teacher. He is our Lord. And if we would only see Jesus for who he really is, I believe, I believe that alone would empower us to put love into action. It would affect every relationship that we have. To not just say we believe, but to live it out. It would impact everything. We need to have a deeper level of commitment and understanding to seeing Jesus as king, as teacher, as Lord, as the disciples were taught in this final moments of his life. But then Jesus says, this is who I am. And this is the basis to which you are to love and serve one another. He follows it up with very clear instructions on how to love and serve people. And I, I love this. I don't, I'm not saying that this part of Scripture or the moments with Jesus and this final meal is the most significant place in Scripture, but it is one of the most clear uh, pieces of instruction that he gives his followers and us. So on the basis of who he is, he gives them these instructions. Jesus modeled it, and we are to model our life like Jesus. That's point number two. And I'll admit, I've struggled. I've struggled to practice what I preach, you know, to live out the things that I encourage people to do in our church. It's a struggle for all of us. But as Paul, you know, when I'm doing this best, as Paul says, to put it on, put on your identity in Christ, we are to model our life like Jesus. And I just, I feel like Christians in 2021 in America, in their Western, you know, post-Christianity culture, they look, we look very differently than the early believers, than the early followers, the first century church. You see, in those days, if you read through Acts, those first century Christians, followers, believers, they didn't just say, they, they did. It was not just talk, it was a way of life. They were the type to underpromise and overdeliver because their faith permeated their behavior. It went into every conversation, every relationship that they had. The early followers were radically committed to Christ, and so must we be. We need to be committed to our faith, to our relationship with Jesus. You see, there's a difference between calling yourself a Christian and being an actual Jesus follower, like an apprentice of our Savior. Being a Jesus follower is a way of life. It's not a label. It's not something we do on a Sunday. It's not watching this message online. It's every day breathing in and out the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught it in this moment. He modeled it in this moment. He modeled what love should look like, what service should look like. And if we do this, if we model our life like Jesus, it will grow and change our relationships radically. This series, in this, this series Ghosted, has all been about relationships and it's had such practical application. But remember that our relationship with God will determine how well we love other people. It will determine how well we love our spouses and our friends. It will determine how we post on social media and how we text our friends and in every way we communicate and our attitudes and our perspectives. It first starts with our relationship with him. And this isn't just, you know, the self-help tips about marriage and friendships and, you know, just a relationship motivational talk. It's about allowing God to show us how to love and truly change the way we love. And we look at his example in order to do that. We can't just say we need to do. This series has had amazing information, but we need to allow it to transform us. We need to allow him to transform us. Jesus modeled this for us. He said this, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Those were, that's the final verse that he said. I'm giving you this example. This is what you are to do. It's really clear. So Jesus, here he is. He's washing the feet of his disciples, his followers. How huge and countercultural that was. He lowered himself in humility to do that. Some people don't realize that it was the lowest servant in that society that would wash the feet of people. And yet Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the living God is doing this as a model, as an example for us. 
we are to model that with our lives. And I'm just convinced that in 2021, with everything that's going on in the world, with all the chaos and the fighting, the media, the elections, the left, the right, the, all this stuff, that people are so tired of hearing about Jesus, they need to see him. And they need to see him through you and through me. We need to model who he is. That's where the, the, the answer is found. It's in the most important relationship we have. It's found in our relationship with him first. And that's point number three. I want you to see this. Our relationship with Jesus changes our relationship with other people. Let me say it again. Our relationship with Jesus changes our relationship with others. How many times have you seen politicians say one thing and do something else? How many times have you done something you said something and you completely did the opposite with your kids, with your spouse, at work. How many Christians, how many of us Christians hear and talk about God's love on Sundays and then we're like angry Monday through Saturday? We in no way reflect him in our, at our work or wherever we go. We need to live differently. We are called to do as Jesus did and it starts by knowing him. We need to know God in an intimate way in order for him to transform us from the inside out so that our behavior, our outward expression will reflect what's going on inside. And it's that interaction, that relationship, that intimacy with Jesus that changes us, nothing else. And because we've been changed because of Jesus and through Jesus, the byproduct of that change is our relationship. He is the source. He's the source of that. So we, you, we need to all make it our commitment to our relationship with Jesus first so that our love for others will flow from it, right? It will be the source of, in the way that we love other people. In these simple verses, he models what it means. He gives us an example. He says, this is who I am. I am Lord. I am teacher. You need to do this. I'm modeling it for you. Go and serve and love other people. And then when we look at a couple uh, chapters later in John 15, I just want to read this for you because it's so profound, it's so powerful. He says this in John 15, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's love in action. That's verse 8. Verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now abide in my love. So Jesus in chapter 15, 8 and 9 He's talking about abiding in his love. He's saying, you are to have love in action. You are, remember the example I gave to you. You are to model this with your life. You're to love and serve other people. Don't just think it, don't just say it, don't just even believe it, but do it, put it into action. How do you do this? By abiding in my love. You see, bearing fruit here means love and action. And I love this word, abide. Throughout all these, the paragraphs and the verses and the paragraphs in chapter 15, he uses the word abide 10 different times. I think he's driving a point home. The word abide in the Greek is meno. It means to remain under, to stay, to reside, be at home with. So in other words, be at home in my love. We need to be people that are at home in the presence and love of Jesus Christ. And so that is the fuel, the source to which we can then go love other people. We need to be at home. We need to abide in his love. Our relationship with Jesus, though, is where it starts. It's the source to which we can love other people. And throughout this series, we've talked about, you know, ghosted. We've talked about all the 2021 modern day dysfunctions and how we act and behave in the bad and the good of our relationships. But nothing, nothing will be the solution for your damaged relationships like the love of Christ. Nothing will resolve the, the conflict and the tension inside of you like the love of Jesus Christ. Are you abiding in Christ? Are you abiding? Are you being at home with his love and allowing him to love others through you so that you can put love in action. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that these aren't just words to hear and something that 
you know, we're doing something else with all these distractions, I pray that we would sit down and be at home with you right now. That we would imbi- abide in your love and you would abide in, uh, in us as you promised. Jesus, change us, transform us, and we invite you into that. If there's anyone watching that doesn't know you, and if that is you, I just pray that you would call out to him, believe in him, place him first, give him your life, receive him as Lord and Savior. He paid for your sin, for your failures, your mistakes. Receive him now. Jesus, throughout this series, we've been challenged. We've been challenged to to produce honor in our relationship and have that be the foundation. We've been challenged to to listen and be slow to speak and slow to anger. We've, We've been challenged to see ourselves as built for community and relationships. And God, I just pray that through our love for you and your love for us, our relationship and intimacy with you, you would change those relationships, that we would live a different life and you would change the world around us because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.